Hey, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, you know, two days ago, Kids, Color kids Count Colorado, which is an organization looking at uh, kids in the valley, released a recent, a recent statistics on the, about children. And one of the things that uh, they studied was the poverty level of students. And for Alamosa, it's close to like about 47%. And the reading level of many of the students also is very, very low. About 47% are not proficient in reading. So this raises a very, very strong concern for the teacher education department. And one of the things that we are trying to do is to get these kids be able to read at the level where, where they are at. And our, our senior black students actually are combining science content with science literacy in their field experience classroom observation hours. So here before you now are, are our senior black students for the teacher education department. And I'll introduce them to you, Ms. Alejandra Velasquez, Ms. Kayla Ozawa, Ms. Tara Wyatt, Ms. Kaylee Smith, and our own Lee. <laughs> our own Lee. <laughs> and we are proud to have him, to have him, Mr. Wesley Robinson. They are going to present to you lessons from field experience. OK, to start off, we uh, we have to do a certain amount of hours to get the degree that we're going in. And for this, we just, uh, it's 20 field hours. So what we're practicing now is like current-based practices, inquiry-based science, and we have been teaching a few science lessons here and there. What we did, we went to Manassa, and we did a science experiment, and it was, we had a dropper, a uh, water droplet, and we put how many drops of water could fit on the face of a penny. We actually didn't think that this experiment would be that fun, but it turned out the kids loved it. So, and now I'm going to talk about the P12 standards. The science standards got revised into three main categories now, life science, physical science, and earth, sci earth science. I don't know, before it was uh, categorized into five groups, but now it's into three, which makes it much easier for us to get where we need to go in science aspect. During these standards, we uh, work on process and inquiry skills, and uh, the P12 standards emphasize uh, the process skills, which helps uh, the students prepare for 21st century skills to help them in the long run of life. Um, we also, in the Alamosa School District, there's a lot of ELL students and SES students. For ELL students, we try to uh, differentiate the uh, lessons so that all students are learning the same material at the same rate. If not, we need to switch it up so that they are getting the same uh, activity and same opportunities as every other student in the class. Also for the SES students, um, like uh, Dr. Alvarez said, it said that it came out in the paper that 43 percent of the students in Alamosa District are not proficient readers. And also, in the Alamosa School District, 30% are low SES, which means that we need to work harder in getting those students up to a proficient level. And then we can also incorporate science by doing that, because we can do reading, writing, math, all in science. If we start out with science, we can incorporate all those different subjects in. Okay, and so there's a few ways that we can incorporate um, reading and science together just like many other contents. Um, one way is the learning cycle and the other way is sheltered instruction. So this first bullet here just says teaching science content and language skills allows ELL learners to learn English through other content areas. Okay, So learning cycle has three um, main parts in it. Here's the picture right here. You first start out with discovery. So that's where you activate the child's background knowledge. So with ELL students, you want to try to connect, use a lot of pictures, use a lot of vocab to try to connect um, what they know in their culture to what you're trying to learn. The next part is concept invention. So that's when you're really putting everything that they know and what you want them to know together. And then you form the concept application where you actually do the project and they actually learn everything 
um, that you wanted to present. Um, and then PSYOP, if you can look at the umbrella picture over there, um, it is known as sheltered instruction, PSYOP. Um, and this is a great picture, and we all liked it a lot because it's the truth. We have an umbrella here at the top, that's your PSYOP. And then underneath it, you have all the categories, like having your kids work in fle flexible groups, differentiate your instruction, focus on the standards, um, different learning strategies for all of your types of students, and incorporating multiple intelligences as well. Okay, and this next one here, we're talking about the learning cycle approach as well. In the cycle, we focus on using objects, concrete objects, concrete materials, so actually doing an experiment. Um, actively engaging your students, and again, that falls under actually doing an experiment. We all learn when we do our hands-on activities. Um, also in that, we want to record and gather our data, and that just means that we get to do our own project, and write it down, and then we get to compare with our other groups and see how things change and how things are the same. Um, we get to interact with our peers, that's our grouping. I think everybody learns best when you work with your peers. And then with that, in the learning cycle, you also want to make sure that you make good observations. And so during our time in the NASA, we did all of these things. We had our materials, which um, we'll be talking about here pretty soon, and we had the kids write down on charts, and um, we had them observe, and just do hands-on activities, so that was really helpful. Okay, so the again, just elaborate a little bit more on the learning cycle. It focuses mainly on the learner, that they internalize the information, that it shapes the information that they learn, and it transforms the information. And so those words kind of go along with the first step where you discover, and the second step where concept intervention, and also concept application. So that just kind of is like in our terms that the children will internalize, shape, and transform the information and make it their own. Um, again, the learning cycle highlights hands-on activities, um, which we can all agree that we love teaching hands-on activities and having the students do that, and we think that they learn the best that way. Okay, so um, part of the learning cycle, the beginning step is getting your concrete materials. Um, at Manasa, we used the pennies, the water, the water dropper. Um, we had regular water and then we had soapy water for the kids to use. And we had all different age groups um, in every single group. So um, on the next slide, when we actually did the experiment, some kids were able to do the penny drops. Um, others, this picture right here, she was very, very young and she was in my group. Um, you would just have to help her with the water dropper but, so she wouldn't drop too many drops all at once. Um, so you kind of helped them and guided them through the information and the recording observations. Um, I had them as a group count out how many drops as each student was doing it. And then we had a little chart that they could graph the information on. Um, the next step um, would have been to make a chart and um, in later slides, we actually did this in class, so we got to do that step in class. Um, we all made our own charts, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so again, through the learning cycle model, we allow students to explore the material, construct a concept, and apply and extend the concept. And we do this by um, allowing the students to make observations, ask a lot of questions, and explain the data. The data and as well as they get the extension also. Um, let's see. Oh, also with this slide I wanted to mention that letting the students do the science experiment allows them to grasp the real concept of the lesson instead of, I'm sure we've all had one of those teachers where they just talk, 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 and everything goes in one year, goes out the next, so they don't really understand or remember it. Okay, so um, it's obvious why we let students present their data. Um, they remember it better, they you know, explain it. They have to learn every detail of, of this lesson in order to explain it to their peers. And even as adults, when we get to teach things, we, get, we learn more and more through teaching it. 
Okay, and here, uh, scaffolding is a huge part of inquiry-based thinking and reasoning. We are their guide. We don't give them the answers, we just scaffold them. We allow them to ask their own questions, explore, and discover. And, um, and through scaffolding, we help them uh, again and not give them the answers. Okay, so like we said before, the learning cycle model is what we use in our science classes. It has three steps to it. And the first step is where we have the students determine science concepts and the language needed for the activities. And the second step is where we engage, explore, and do concept development. And the engaging is the big part, because if they're not engaged in the activity, then they're not going to be interested in it. And the third step is where we, we determine if the student is able to talk about the concept and apply it to real life or whatever they can. OK, so. To incorporate language and writing skills into science, we use the CER framework, which is claim, evidence, reason. So when you have a claim, evidence, reason, you need to have a question. So for our activity, we had, our question was, how many drops of water can fit on a penny? Um, a claim is a statement that answers the question. And for our claim, we said, on a penny, there are 30 drops of water, or on penny A, there are 30 drops of water, and on penny B, there would be 15, and penny B was different because it was dipped in soap. Our evidence evidence is observations made, data collected, and recorded. So our evidence can be seen in our chart and record sheet that we have the students do. And for our evidence, penny A has more drops than penny B. And the reason helps answer the why. The soap, so for our reason, it was the soap decreased the surface tension of the water making it vulnerable to spill and spray out off the surface of the penny. Okay, in the next couple of slides, we have some uh, pictures that where we were actually out in the field in the NASA again, as we said. And these are a few of the lessons that we learned. We'll explain them as we view the pictures. Okay, so if you look at the top one right here, we started out with reading a story. So that's where we use language activities incorporated in with our science lesson. Um, if you see this other top one right up here, um, there's a big question. It says, how many drops of water will fit on a penny? Right next to that, we had our um, vocabulary words, cohesion and surface, surface tension. Um, so that was um, to use critical words to explain the science concepts that we're learning. Um, and then as you can see, in all of the bottom ones, there was a lot of collaboration. Um, we as teachers were talking to the students and trying to get them to ask more questions and try to help them understand what was really going on, why there was a bubble on top of um, the penny. Um, and then also we, the use of concrete objects. You can see we have plates, pennies, their data sheet, water soap, the droppers, all of that good stuff to actually make the experiment a success. Okay. Uh yeah, she said that we use the concrete objects. Again, you can see the papers, the pennies. Um, for the low uh, SES, this was one of those communities where almost all of the kids were like that. And at first we were expecting, you know what, the kids are not gonna enjoy this lesson because we're getting there, they just got finished with school, they're gonna be doing more lessons. You know, but when we got there, we did this science experiment, they said they never get to do things like this in class and they enjoyed it. They wanted us to stay longer. <laughs> and so um, just getting the kids to do hands-on inquiry-based learning was uh, really important to these students. And I believe that teachers everywhere should be doing inquiry-based teaching and letting the kids do hands-on learning, questioning, and uh, developing their own concept of what things are. This is just our last slide, and we all wanted to share that um, we all agree, just like Alejandra just said, that we were expecting the students to be tired, bored, not wanting to do anything um, when we got them. But they came in, and we had no behavior issues, which was amazing. Everyone, and we thought we were going to have behavior issues because before, the kids were kind of wild when we were eating and stuff like that but they just were ready to learn and so excited and some of the teachers and administrators came in 
and they said, you know, I want to do this in my classroom. Like, I wish I could do this. And so it was just awesome for us to be here at Adams and learning this way and then going out to smaller communities and saying, hey, you can do it, we can do it, and it's fun. We have fun doing it, it's not boring, and the kids obviously enjoyed it a lot. So. I also just wanted to say that during the field experience between Manassa and everything else, like we, we go to the elementary school all day on Tuesday, like we learn how to, this the observation hours give us a great insight on how to communicate with young children and even like fourth and fifth graders and how to teach them and let them figure out the own, their own answer and their own concept of an experiment. So it's, it's been a great experience for us being first year teachers, first year teachers to learn how to communicate and teach young children. And I believe that's it.